thank you everyone for coming for my talk. Uh, uh, forward, if I'm a little bit aphasic, uh, please ap I apologize beforehand. Uh, flew up from Australia, so time zone difference is still uh, catching up with me at the moment. Um, but yes, uh, you know, let's uh, you know talk a little bit about context. So um, we've all heard a lot of uh, um, talk about AI over the last day and a bit. Uh, particularly the uh, transformer model of families, Gen AI, uh, large language models. Um, and that's all really interesting. But we're going to take a detour today. And the detour is going to be talking about the other intelligent machine, one that we sort of take for granted. But every one of us, you and I, dog, cat, all possess. And that is the brain. Now, why is this relevant? The reason for that is that um, despite the fact that we've done amazing things with our current AI technologies, they still require a significant amount of energy and also a significant amount of, um, of uh, uh, sample data in order to train. Um, whereas if we start thinking about the brain, how is it all doing this? We, you know, we have this complex organ that is um, processing information that is able to do abstract reasoning, uh, cognition of, of what's happening and, and processing of that. And if you take a few steps back and you say, well, you know, we all, we all have slightly different brains, animals have different brains, but what is the common thing that makes up a brain? And that is the neuron. So what does a neuron look like? And I, I, I figure it's probably best to just show it. So this is uh, me, and you know we've got a Discord, so uh, if anyone wants to uh, chat, we're there. But this is what a neuron looks like. Um, this here is, oh, I wonder if that, oh, anyway, I'm just going to point. So that long thing there is an axon. And all the stringy bits, like melted cheese, are essentially um, dendrites. Dendrites that form synapses with one another. And 10 microns for scale is one-fifth the width of a human hair. So this is a scanning electron microscopy image. Now, if we zoom out a little bit further out, you can see a lattice. That lattice is a CMOS-based chip. And what this image shows is the level of integration of the neurons onto the silicon substrate. Now, I have one of these devices here, actually, to show, the one that's right there. And this is, a, this is actually one of the chips that we've, been, we've actually used to do um, experiments with. There were some neurons on, on here, but we sterilized them on the way up here. So um, now, if we take a few steps back and we say, so what does a neuron do? And how does it communicate with one another? A neuron um, fires electrical impulses from one to another uh, when they want to send a signal. Uh, this is called an action potential. And because these neurons are sitting on a bed of electrodes, uh, we can read this electrical activity. And we can also. Uh, stimulate them by providing a reverse voltage charge. So now we have this read and write uh, interface into a biological uh, structure. Um, so let's see what is required in order to, um, to turn these things into computational devices. Uh, video, please. So because you can't come down to my lab, but if you ever do come down to Melbourne, you're more than welcome to visit. Um, this is how we grow the cells. They, they live in an incubator that you know, maintains homeostasis, so a, a set uh, oxygen level, um, CO2, temperature, humidity, and so forth. Um, and, and this is a glass chip, a uh, glass multi-electrode array device. And this is how we interface with the, with the neurons. Um, that pink fluid is uh, uh, a uh, cell culture media called brain fizz, that is essentially artificial cerebral spinal fluid. Um, it's got glucose, uh, large factor proteins um, that nourish and keep the cells alive. And each individual dot, white, little white dots, are essentially neural clusters that grow on the chip. Um, so you must be thinking, how, do we, how, how does this all uh, stay alive? And that fluid essentially nourishes the cells. And the cells, being living organisms, will actually create waste. And that, over time, changes the, the chemical composition um, of uh, the cell culture media. 
And cell culture media is, is really important to keep that in a very narrow range because neurons are particularly sensitive uh, to changes in osmolarity. So that's the concentration of the uh, solutes, particularly potassium and sodium, because that's what's used to, to transmit that um, electrical impulse. And so this is a process of just taking out 50% of the fluid and replacing it. That's a very manual uh, task that we do in order to keep these cells running and in a sort of a healthy uh, shape. So this is what they look like under a microscope. And I think this is fascinating because you get to see the juxtaposition of a biological network growing on a silicon network. And you can see there's this, um, there are all these little pads. And these little pads are what picks up the electrical impulses. And that's an exon or neural bundles that run between one cluster and another. That's sort of parallel following the actual um, electrode traces. So what we do once we, once we plate those cells, and it takes about two to three weeks for maturation, is we then put them into a reader. Um, and this takes the action potential signals from the neurons and uh, converts it into a digital, digital signal and um, provides that to a computing system and back again uh, we stimulate the neurons. And this is an example of the neural activity trace that runs, and each dot is an action potential that's firing. And, um, and uh, you know, that's uh, the way we actually interface that with the computer program. And it's really important that you have this computer program because it turns out the neurons like structured information. So this is a paper that was published last year uh, in um, Neuron. Um, it's got all the details, so I'm just gonna, I'm going to skip through a lot of this stuff, but it's, it's very dense. It's really interesting as well if uh, any of you are, are keen on the, on the science. But essentially, how we managed to get these neurons to perform the game of Pong is a combination of various disciplines. So we had stem cell tissue culture, um, that where we, we take um, uh, blood, uh, turn them into uh, adult-induced pluripotent stem cells, and from there, differentiate them into neurons. That gets uh, integrated with systems neuroscience to understand you know, concepts like lateral inhibition, how do we encode where the position of the ball is to the paddle and so forth. Um, uh, electrical engineering to wire up all the chips and the neurons. And you know, what's really important is the software engineering because in order to get these things to work, you need a closed loop system. The neurons need the ability to to uh, be embodied, so to speak, in an environment. They need to be able to sense uh, uh, stimulus, perform actions on that stimulus, and then see the, the outcomes of that. And this is really important as part of the free energy principle, which is a theory that's been developed by Professor Carl Friston at UCL. It's a very complicated uh, theory of how potentially intelligence works, but to surmise, it's, um, it's a... It, it uh, uh, assumes that the brain is a giant Bayesian predictive machine, that you and I right now are forming uh, predictions ahead of time about what the world is, and our senses are confirming or disproving those predictions. And this is how we actually get the neurons to work. Um, so if we can get video, please. Oop. So. This is a visualization, and if anyone's interested, this is on spikestream.corticolabs.com. It's a 3D visualization of the electrical signal on a surface of a chip. Um, there are uh, you know, tiles that represent the electrodes, and uh, we encode the position of the ball in relationship to the paddle uh, in two ways. We do it via uh, place encoding. So you don't see our stimulus on this system because we, we blind ourselves to our own stimulus, um, but we, we stimulate um, eight different regions on that big section there um, for the y-axis. And the x-axis is encoded using rate encoding. So the closer the ball gets to the paddle, the faster we stimulate them. Um, those two bottom regions there are motor regions. And um, what we do, there's no magic, there's no AI or machine learning. It's a simple uh, summing of the activity squared. Uh, more activity in one pushes the paddle up. More activity in the other one pushes the paddle down. So it turns out what you need to do in order to get that whoop, to, to, to actually play is you need a reward and punishment process. And um, it turns out that 
uh, based on this free energy principle, which posits that neurons want to get really good at predicting the world, if you give them a signal that has uh, low entropy, um, i.e. like a sine wave, that's, a, that's a, a rewarding thing. And if you give it a high entropy signal, like white noise, that's a punishing thing. And it turns out you really do need this push and pull reward punishment system in order for them to work. It's all detailed in the paper. So if there's more interest, please, please look into that. Um, but anyway, now that we've talked about the paper, the question is why, why do we do all of this, right? And, and the reason for that is, as you all know, there is a race to do uh, artificial generalized intelligence. But everyone is thinking about it from artificial neural networks. And as far as we know from our work and what neuroscience is now understanding of how neurons work, the artificial neural nets that we've developed are very different from how we now understand the neurons work in in vitro or in vivo settings. For instance, um, the, the uh, nonlinearity functions in artificial neural networks are mostly static and fixed, and that's how we get the speedups from you know, matrix multiplications using GPUs and so forth. But as far as we know, in, in biological neurons, they're a floating number or they can change from one state to another based on neurotransmitter values. Um, and then each of them are slightly different, which then means that if you do want to simulate a real biological neuron, you're back into CPU for loops. Um, and so the question then becomes, why, why try to do um, artificial generalized intelligence using silicon when we can try an alternative approach, a detour, using biology? Because at the end of the day, the only truly generalized intelligence system that we know of are biological in nature, you and I, a dog and a cat. So that's where we, where we are, uh, where we were. This is where we are at the moment. And we think about this as a progression. And you know, it's, it's great that you know, we had Jürgen uh, Schmidhuber talking about the, the history of artificial intelligence and it spanning all the way back into the 40s. And if you think about the current silicon industry that we have today, it, it, it goes all the way back to the 50s. And we think that the, the system that we have right now is equivalent to the IBM S360 um, of, the, of, the, of the 60s. And for that, you have, you know, Brett, who's my uh, chief scientific officer there, uh, reference for skill for a, a big incubator system. And, you know, we have teams of technicians keeping the systems alive. And the thought process goes, what do you really need in order to take this to the next level? Uh, systems that are uh, more accessible, i.e. smaller, uh, cheaper to run programming interfaces and abstractions, because if we think about how we do our computing systems today, they're all built on levels of abstractions, right? We don't, we don't think about how assembly works, right? We, we write a high-level language like Python that gets compiled down to instruction sets that are specific to a CPU. And so this is something that we're working on as well at Cortical Labs, which is how do, you, how do you take what we've learned in the computing industry and turn it into something that is more accessible um, and, and, and uh, able to be uh, used as a tool going forward. And so the, the Apple I, I guess, was the, the inspiration for building what we call the CL1, which we have right here, the, the first, uh, one of the first industrial prototypes of a biological computer. And it took 30 years from the Apple I to get to the iPhone. The question is, where are we going to go in 30 years with a technology like this? Now, what's interesting about a technology like this synthetic biological intelligence is the fact that because it's biological in nature, and the fact that we've trained it to do something, playing the game Pong, we've also done the Chrome Offline Jumping Dinosaur game, is that it can apply to two different industries. On one hand, you have um, the biopharmaceutical industry, where players in that space want to control the wetware, wetware being the cells. And um, on the other side of the spectrum, you have software engineers, um, ML researchers, who don't really care so much about the wetware, but really want to control the software. And so this brings this whole notion of what is a biological computer? And our thinking internally of what a biological computer is, is that it's your traditional computer, hardware and software. But in addition to those two, you have a third vertex point, which is the wetware. And what's fascinating is that this gives you an extra lever to actually change the overall parameters of the system. So to give you an example, the original Pong paper was using wetware that came from 
uh, mice, so those were primary rodent cultures, and also um, uh, human-induced pluripotent stem cells. And what was interesting was that we showed that the human cells outperform the mice cells, which is great for humanity, right? At least we're still smarter than, than mice. Um, but you can also start thinking about uh, changing the wetware. So for instance, potentially using cells with epilepsy, seeing how they perform, and then using drugs to change the parameters of the, the operation of that system. Conversely, on the software side, right, you could try a different game, perhaps, or a different simulation um, to give you a different outcome. So some other games that we've looked at was, was the, the Chrome of line jumping dinosaur game. But you know, there are many other ones. And you know, the question becomes, what happens if you start feeding in streams of information coming out from real world sensors or from, from the internet? And this is something that we're working on through our, our APIs and SDKs to try to, to abstract away the complications of you know, what an action potential is, how do you stem them, and so on and so forth. And one example that I talked about, this epilepsy flow, there's actually a, a poster that we, ha we, we, we had, and uh, if anyone's interested, you know, you're, you're more than welcome to find me, where what we've actually done is we've taken um, cells from patients with intractable temporal lobe epilepsy, and we've plated them on uh, the system, and we've seen epileptiform uh, seizure-like activity on the, on the cells. And to no surprise, they don't learn how to play the game, uh, the Pong game. But what's fascinating is that if you treat those cells with uh, the anti-seizure medications, uh, not all of the anti-seizure medications work, but a select few do, and that reduces the seizure activity. And um, with that reduction in seizure activity, they start learning how to play the game again. But what an interesting observation we've seen is that not all drugs have the same effect. Some drugs actually cause uh, a minor, or sometimes actually even a major uh, cognitive decline in the cells. And this is actually fascinating because um, one of the major reasons of uh, patient discontinuation from, from medications like you know, anti-seizure medications or even chemotherapy is this brain fog or chemo brain that people talk about. And, um, and uh, this, is, this is something that uh, we've been uh, looking at as a potential application, where in the future, you could imagine taking blood from a patient, running an essay. So rather than you know, going in to see a doctor and getting a prescription, coming back six weeks later and saying, did it work or were there any side effects? You get the answer in a dish that says, don't bother with drug A to D, go straight to E, because we didn't see any side effects and it had a very good, um, we had a very good response to the medication. So this is the vision of the future. Uh, this is what we call the CL1 system. And this is actually a, a, a prototype device that I bought up uh, from our lab. And what it is, is essentially uh, a system to keep these cells alive um, over extended periods of time. If we can get the video, please, and we can see how that kind of works. So this is, this is a lab prototype device. And what it is, is, is that, well, this is the same thing, but in a different form factor, that has um, all the components to keep cells alive outside of the body. So we have triple diastolic pumps, equivalent to the heart. We have uh, a gas exchange system, filtration units, so lung, kidney, brain in the center, of course, um, and the ability to keep the cells at a constant 37 degrees Celsius, which is core body temperature, and a feeding and a waste mechanism. So with that in mind, you know, we, we would love to start thinking about how could you scale the, uh, the, these cells in order to start programming them, using them for uh, drug discovery, and so on and so forth. Um, can we get the video off, please? Next slide. So here are some of the papers that uh, my team and I have uh, published. Um, very excited to say that the Critical Dynamics paper uh, recently was published, uh, peer-reviewed in Nature Communications. And um, if anyone is ever interested in um, what's called the critical brain theory, where neurons are, or the brain is, is, uh, is 
uh, how to describe it? It's a, it's a complex theory, but I'm going to try and simplify it. Uh, works at the edge of chaos in the sense that uh, it's a complex dynamical system like water, and water has this critical point at 0 and 100 degrees Celsius, where water molecules have a 50% chance of turning into steam or remaining as a liquid. It turns out that neurons also have this critical dynamics, where in order for information processing to happen, um, you, you need to have the Goldilocks zone of just enough um, electrical activity and not too much, because if you have too much, you end up causing an entire network to fire spontaneously. And that, that is essentially a seizure-like uh, seizure uh, uh, waveform. Or conversely, if you don't have enough uh, baseline activity, your, your action potentials do not propagate far enough. So it turns out when we've examined the, the, uh, the dynamics of the system when, when playing Pong and versus in rest mode, the neurons actually exhibit this criticality point while engaged in a task. And we think this is extremely fascinating as a way of looking at how we could use alternative measures for um, determining information processing in these biological systems. Um, with that, um, that's the end of my talk, and uh, I open it up for any questions. Thank you very much, Han. That was completely fascinating. We've only got three minutes. So we're going to have to yep. be really efficient with our Q&A. So one of the things that I wanted to ask you about, having taken diligent notes in the background, <laughs> there's a statement in the synopsis where it talks about the organic mind mm. being a better learner yes. than any digital model. Uh -huh. Now, we keep being told that artificial general intelligence is going to be a super intelligence that's potentially going to destroy humanity. Mm. Are you making the opposite case? Yes. And the reason for that is, it's one of the papers there, and actually was a poster at NeurIPS. You have to think about it in terms of, of sample efficiency. Now, uh, what do I mean by sample efficiency? That paper compares a reinforcement learning, well, actually not a, three different reinforcement learning algorithms. And what we then did was we said, you're going to get the same amount of data, the same amount of frames that the biological system has, and we're going to evaluate how well you learn how to play the game mm -hmm. in real time. And it's not surprising once you think about it, the biological systems actually outperform reinforcement learning. Now, if we think about all of this talk about the superintelligence, it's great. But we have to remember that GPT-4 or GPT-X has learned to be this good by ingesting the entirety of the internet. Right. right? Now, the question is, how do we as humans, still get around, communicate effectively, uh, problem solve, and have abstract reasoning with a fraction of the information on the internet. I mean, we can take reassurance that most of the stuff that's on the internet is either porn or wrong, <laughs> right? So that, or, or that's Reddit how I or sleep 4chan. at night, right? Yes. <laughs> so, so I think it's 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 fair to say, and and you know, this is also going back to the energy point of view. If there's 20 watts of energy, right, that the brain consumes. That's essentially, if we put 10 subject matter experts in a room, still cheaper to run than a single GPU in terms of energy efficiency. Oh, I like that. So right? there's a climate-friendly angle to it your argument. It certainly is. It's, but yeah. can we outsmart superintelligence? Very great question. And if I, we're augmented in, in the way that you've described. Well, I think that's what Elon believes in, and that's the reason why he's uh, trying to uh, uh, even the scores by connecting us up with machines. 50-something seconds left. I'm intrigued yeah. in your training as a medical doctor and how you made the path from that to what you're doing now. How is that informing your view of what it's going to mean to be a healthy, happy human being who's mm. flourishing in this brave new world of AI? So I, I think, you know, and this is, is a really important thing with any technology, which is that it has to, it has to prove its reason for existence, right? It has to be a net good. Just like you know, mm -hmm. things like fire, right? Could be used to cook your food, could be used to burn someone's house down. But we didn't outlaw fire because there was more good to be had. And this is the angle that we're taking, and 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 my perspective of this technology, which is sure, yes, we could do a lot of interesting AI tasks and so forth. But the more immediate good 
more immediate impact that we can have is can we use this for start you know, screening for compounds for, for epilepsy, for better treatment of, of, of neurological conditions? Could we use this as an in vitro model for testing for dementia? I mean, this is, this is the brave new world, and I hope that you know, we could be part of that journey of discovery and hopefully you know, eradicating or curing you know, these intractable diseases that we have today. I mean, that's an inspiring note to end on. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking Han.